This is Bravo 2. The following program contains strong language and scenes of violence. I'm in Mexico City, where organized crime has caused more violence than lots of wars. I don't know where they Rocket-propelled grenades, AK-47s, bazookas. The government has lost control here. This is a city where no one is safe on the streets. It is true, the violence and the crime that's reported. It is true. Where ruthless kidnapping gangs are terrorizing the population. You prepare in a way to be killed. These people don't deserve death. Death would glorify them. Mexico City, the capital of Mexico, is populated by 20 million people and is one of the largest cities in the world. Every year, 12 million tourists from around the globe visit the city of mariachis and margaritas. But look beyond the color and the cocktails and you discover that Mexico City is an extremely volatile place. The gap between rich and poor has grown rapidly over the years, leading to a phenomenal rise in violent crime that makes Mexico City one of the most dangerous places on the planet. I'm here to find out how a combination of poverty and corruption has led to a crime and murder epidemic in Mexico City that last year claimed the lives of more than five and a half thousand people. As a tourist, it's very easy to be unaware of the dangerous underbelly that might exist in a foreign country. But here in Mexico City, it seems that violence and death are on public display. Just a glance at any newspaper stall in the city leaves you in no doubt about the scale of violent crime that happens here on a daily basis. Look at this. This is the um, back page of uh, one of the main papers here, La Prensa. Um, police, gangsters, dead bodies. Look, strewn all over the place. Unbelievable. These graphic pictures are fed to the papers by photographers who arrive on the scene immediately after a violent crime. They take gruesome photos which appear on the front pages of the next day's newspapers. I'm here to meet a British contact who's arranged for me to go out on a nighttime photo shoot with Mexico City's violent crime paparazzi. This is Monumento. We're here, and uh, all these guys are um, crime reporters with various different newspapers, radio stations, these guys as well. And uh, they basically just hang out here and, and uh, wait for any information to come in. Maybe they're scanning the radio, so they're getting information that way. And uh, just see if there's a murder or an accident, and then from here they'd, they'd leg it off to, to wherever the accident is and go and cover the news. So why is it uh, dangerous? Um, it's dangerous because you never know if, if something's gone down, like a shootout outside of a bar or something, you never know if it's still happening or if more trouble kicks off when the police gets there. So they have come across, like, you know, bullets flying and, or they, they've, they've had their cameras ripped away or they've been shoved around, beaten up. There is a risk, you know, anything can happen at night. John introduced me to one of the most experienced crime reporters in the city. Why are the images that you uh, take of dead bodies and riddled bodies um, so popular with the public? The majority of people like to see dead people, blood. People go straight to the murder section in the papers, see the photographs, and they just stay there. 
I'm beginning to suspect that violence and death are an accepted part of the culture here. It seems that everywhere you look, there's a police car. Everywhere. Cruising the streets. But as yet, no action from the boys. Some nights they say that they're going backwards, to and fro, 100 miles an hour, all across the city. But for the moment, it's quiet. But it surely can't be quiet for too long. Let's go. Soon enough, the photographers intercept a call about a murder across town. The press team speed through the streets, running red lights and screeching around corners in a death-defying race to be the first to arrive at the scene of the crime. We arrive at the scene at the same time as the first police officers. And sure enough, there's a dead body lying in the street. The police make half-hearted attempts to keep the photographers at bay. And the arrival of the ambulance seems of secondary importance to capturing the images that will sell to the newspapers. I'm beginning to think that in Mexico City, the business of death is more important than the life of the victims. Well, this is the guy's uh, staple diet, dead bodies, mayhem. They believe that it was a uh, gunshot, um, the back of the head. As you can see, the scene's a little more chaotic than they would be back in the UK or the US, or um, we've allowed ridiculously close to the scene of the shooting. Finally, the police cordon off the area and start gathering evidence. We may be stepping on the casing, and that's how uh, quick the reporters, the crime reporters, have got to the scene. We're now being asked to lift up our feet because the bullet casing that um, took that man's life is just here. And that was found by the photographer. It seems that the photographers have got what they need and the scene starts to wind down. This is a very common scene for you, David. This is a normal night. Yes, it is very common here in Mexico City. That's what we see here every day. Um, do you ever worry that you might end up on the front page as a dead body of a in a newspaper yourself. Sometimes it goes to your head, right? Sometimes you think you could be the dead person they take a picture of. It's like the golden rule between us. If one of us gets killed, we won't take a picture of him out of respect for each other. I knew Mexico City was dangerous, but I wasn't expecting to see this level of violence so soon after arriving here. This place is definitely not for the faint-hearted. Coming up. I find out that drug gangs have caused record levels of violence on the streets of Mexico City. More than 500 police and soldiers have been murdered this year by drug gangs. And I discover why it's not just Mexicans who are being targeted by criminals. This girl that I know that was taken away was beaten up, just dumped in this remote area. I'm in Mexico City and so far I've seen that life is cheap and murder and mayhem on the streets are an everyday thing. But this is a city of colour and contrast where visitors are made to feel welcome and people know how to throw a party.
even death here is a cause for celebration. Mexico City is famous for its Day of the Dead festival, held every November on the Catholic Holy Days of All Saints Day and All Souls Day. Millions of people pay tribute to the dead at a ceremony which dates back thousands of years to the Aztec Indians. Maybe this uniquely Mexican fascination with death is one of the reasons why murder and violence have always been out in the open here in Mexico City. Riots, revolutions and violence are in the Mexican DNA. In 1968, thousands of students protesting against the government were massacred by soldiers and police who opened fire on the unarmed civilians. This culture of violence, coupled with the severe economic recession in the 1990s, led to a massive increase in crime that saw Mexico City explode into lawlessness. I'm meeting with a crime journalist, Ian Grillo, to find out more about the situation on the ground. Just give us a flavor of Mexico City and crime. Crime here really exploded in the 1990s. You've got a lot of forms of robbery or extortion, ways of getting money, carjacking, kidnapping for ransom. These kind of crimes are very common in Mexico City. The criminal organizations realize they can get away with it. Crime pays. In many cases, there's been many proven cases where police are working with organized crime. This climate of corruption has given Latin America's most ruthless drug gangs freedom to ply their murderous trade on the streets of this city. There's 4,000 drug-related murders in one year in Mexico. They want to send a message out. They want to show their rivals that we're going to kill you, often in very terrifying ways. Sometimes they'll kill the people, kill everyone around them as well. Sometimes they'll chop their heads off and put their heads with a note. Sometimes they'll kill them on video and put the video on the internet. Uh, so they kill them in a way to try and terrorize their enemies as well. But they also want to speak to the population, to the people. They want to speak to the street. And they want to tell the street, we're the guys running this show. You don't go to the police to talk about us, you give us information. They want to show they can kill any time, any place, and get away with it. Ian took me to a place right in the heart of this city where a recent incident had increased the people's belief that the cartels were free to kill anyone that opposed them. Well, it was rush hour in November, uh, November, and a Learjet plane came crashing right down onto the street. Exploded in flames, killed everyone on board and killed several people driving that day, uh, and people walked on the street. And on board that plane was the number two in the government, he's the interior secretary. And also on board was a, a federal prosecutor called Jose Luis Santiago Vasconcelos, who was a very dedicated anti-crime fighter. Although the plane crash was officially recorded as an accident, both high-ranking politicians on board were dedicated opponents of the cartels. So, so explain the trajectory of the plane. Obviously, traffic you know, was immediately thrown all over the place. People were, you know, were burnt up came down a ball of flames and then it carried on pushing through here with engines, wings thrown all over the place. So they started throwing stuff to this building here and you can see from the building here where it's all boarded up now uh, where parts of the aircraft were thrown onto it. I can't believe that a disaster of this scale could have been engineered by drug cartels, especially when it involved killing high-ranking politicians. Surely the gangsters here aren't powerful enough to take out a vice president. Right now in the climate Mexico is in, there's been attacks on hundreds of police and soldiers this year. More than 500 police and soldiers across Mexico have been murdered this year by drug gangs. One guy, the head of the federal police, was shot there by drug gangs in his own house. He went home, opened the door, there was a guy there with a gun, shot him dead in his house. In that kind of climate, something like this happens and everybody immediately thought you know this is drug gangs or some kind of killing that's the first thought that came to most mexicans head who's running mexico you know it seems in a state of flux a state of absolute chaos and violence we're talking about armed groups in mean, an organized crime drug cartels with thousands of men at arms using rocket propelled grenades ak-47s 
AR-15s, bazookas. I mean, these guys have done more carnage than a lot of guerrilla uprisings. This is more violence than a lot of war, so you get a real sense of the government has lost control here. It's shocking to hear that the drug cartels have such a stranglehold over Mexico that the country appears to be sliding into total lawlessness. Mexico is the main supply route for cocaine and other drugs entering the US. And so, since the early 90s, America has been involved in helping the Mexican government's war on drugs. Unfortunately, their relative success encouraged the drug cartels to diversify. Kidnapping in Mexico City is big business and has now reached epidemic proportions. Last year alone, there were 1,028 kidnapping reports in Mexico. That's almost three a day. 65 of those victims were killed. Kidnappings in Mexico are organized crime operations motivated purely by money. Experts point to a link between the rise in kidnappings and the increasing gap that separates the rich and the poor. In a society like this, it soon becomes necessary for those with money to invest heavily to protect themselves from criminals. I'm on my way to meet a man whose business it is to provide rich people with security on the mean streets of Mexico City. Francisco Marina is the head of an organization called CIOS. It's the Center of Information and Operations for Security. This company is one of the largest private security firms in Mexico City. Unfortunately, kidnapping in this country is a reality. Kidnappings are on the increase. They are becoming more aggressive and barbaric, and now we are finding a lot of mutilations. Well-established gangs trained by drug traffickers whose life is violence and crime are turning to kidnapping. The fact that these criminals are new to kidnapping generates a higher risk of mortality for the victims. The saddest part is that anti-kidnapping officers are involved in kidnapping themselves. This is no secret. It's all over the media. It's a shame that these sorts of organizations do well because people in Mexico City simply can't trust the police. In this climate, the kidnapping problem can only get worse. Now I'm going to meet a young man who went through the horror of a kidnap ordeal and lived to tell the tale. Rodrigo Chavez was approached by two men and seized at gunpoint whilst visiting a friend in this middle-class neighborhood. I remember I, I raised my hands. They told me, don't raise your hands, don't raise your hands. At that point, the kidnappers bundled Rodrigo into a car and drove off. And they started asking me things like, uh, how much do you think your family could pay for your life? Well, that, that's a question that I didn't know how to answer. Maybe they could pay uh, 100,000 pesos. And, and he told me, OK, we're, we'll, we would ask for 200,000. Rodrigo was taken to a house in an unknown location. The kidnappers were going to ask for a ransom sum equivalent to 10,000 pounds. He feared the worst. They told me, OK, calm down. Just don't, don't do stupid things. Don't try to escape. Don't try to run away. And you're going to be all right. They gave me food, but I didn't want to eat because my stomach at that point was shattered. It's a funny feeling because you kind of prepare 
in a way to be killed. Because you know that they can do it uh, any time. Rodrigo's parents negotiated his release and paid the ransom. When they told me that, that uh, the ransom had been paid, well, I, I was glad. They told me, this is what you're going to do. We're going to take you in the car. We're going to leave you in some place. You're going to walk uh, 100 uh, steps. And you, you don't have to look back. Because if you look back, we're going to shoot you. Despite their terrifying ordeal, Rodrigo and his family decided not to contact the authorities. We never wanted to go to police, never, because I was free. You don't know if, the, if it's true that the police is ganged up with these guys. If they are connected in some way. We, we talked about it and we said we're not going to the police because you don't know if they're going to take revenge on us. Coming up, I experienced the long arm of the law Mexican style. <laughs> And I meet a man who took the law into his own hands after his daughter was brutally murdered. She was shot with a 45 caliber gun in the neck. I'm in Mexico City, one of the kidnapping capitals of the world, and I'm getting a taste of how organized crime is terrorizing these streets. I'm shocked by what I've seen in a city that seems to be spiraling out of control. Kidnapping is a big problem here, but even a bigger problem is the widespread corruption amongst the police that lets crime go unpunished. I've heard that the Mexican government has promised to tackle this issue, so I'm on my way to meet the newly formed anti-kidnapping unit. These specially chosen cops are said to be incorruptible. If that's true, then they are in a minority amongst the Mexican police force. As I arrive at the police training ground, a press officer tells me what operations the unit will be demonstrating in today's drill. We are going to simulate a kidnap. We are going to use a sniper. We'll be using live firearms. The team are well tooled up and the dummy hostage is brought in to be rescued. I'm a bit surprised they're allowing me to stay so close to the action. This exercise depends upon the accuracy of those snipers up there. They're going to take out the uh, uh, watchmen over there and less than seven metres away. So I don't know whether they need to... With the kidnappers dealt with and the hostage safe, the simulated rescue is over. Let's go, is it? <laughs> One of the officers has agreed to answer some of my questions. How do you protect your unit from infiltration from criminals? We spend most of our lives in the unit. We get to know each other. When we see someone acting strangely, we speak to them, and if necessary, get rid of them. The anti-kidnapping unit put on a good show of strength and solidarity. 
but I wonder how much of it was a PR display for me and the Mexican journalists. Are they making any real difference on the streets? To find out, I'm going to talk to some British expats who've been living here for a while. Sarah, a news reporter, and Hannah, a publishing editor, both came to Mexico to pursue their respective careers. What's the perception of those at home? Are they worried for you here when they read stories about uh, Mexico and crime? I know that my parents do worry. Um, I'm sure they would prefer that I was at home in England with them. I think Mexico does have a negative press in the UK. And, I mean, it's fair to say that as well, though there is a lot of crime in the city. Yeah, and they worry because they, it is true. Mm -hmm. That's the problem, it is true. You know, the problems that are reported and the violence and the crime that's reported. Like, if you go and look for that, then yeah, you would find yourself in real problems. I wouldn't live here with a family. Mm -hmm, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I wouldn't say. have a family here for someone of my age for the next couple of years, fine. But not forever. And for the next couple of years, I can enjoy all the exciting aspects and avoid the danger and not have a family here. When my parents were here, for example, I would never take a street taxi because to have three English people in a car, all obviously foreign, is just more of a risk than myself going, speaking to them in Spanish. Sarah and Hannah explained how unsuspecting tourists would get robbed at gunpoint after getting into taxis whose drivers would then take them hostage. They call them express kidnappings and they normally last an hour because they stop at a cash point and ask them to take out what they can and do it with the different cards that they've got and give them the PIN number so that they can do it so they can check that they're taking as much as possible. This girl that I know that was taken away, a foreigner like us, and she was beaten up, just dumped in this remote area. I'm a bit worried to hear that catching a taxi can be so dangerous to tourists, especially since I've been riding in them innocently since my arrival here. And with the express kidnappings being so common, it's obvious that tourists are just as much a target as locals. The next day I wanted to find out about the dangers of riding taxis in Mexico City. I flagged down a cab, but this time I realized I could be risking my life. How big a problem is kidnapping in your life and in the life of people you know? I have known people who have carried out serious kidnappings. They have up to five new cars, all taxis. So people actually buy taxis and conduct a business just for Kidnap Express. For this kidnapping business, yes. In one or two months, you can earn 18,000 pounds. It's incredible what you can earn. Taxis are the key. I'm really getting a sense of how widespread the kidnapping problem is here in Mexico City, because I've just pulled over a taxi at random, and the driver is telling me that he knows personally a number of people from his own neighborhood that run kidnapping operations. Are they fearsome people? Are they scary? Are they violent? No, not scary. They are just people I know from childhood. We say hello to each other, but to others, they are a threat. From your experience, um, what percentage of, of kidnappings are ever reported to the police? Approximately 98% of cases don't get reported. 
Very few people report them. This is because the authorities are working alongside the kidnappers. And this made people afraid to go to the police. They know where you live. Okay, well, listen, thank you very much. It seems that here in Mexico City, no one is safe from the kidnapping scourge. I found out that not only are rich people and tourists being kidnapped, but increasingly, poor people are becoming a target too. Recent kidnaps have taken place with a ransom demand for as little as $200. I've heard about a recent case that shocked the city already hardened to crime and violence. The incident involved the kidnapping of a five-year-old boy by a teenage next-door neighbor. Javier Morena was kidnapped and killed in one of the most deprived areas of Mexico City. His family are poor and there seemed to be no motive for the kidnapping. The incident has sent shockwaves through the community the local woman has agreed to speak. Truth is, it doesn't matter whether you've got money or not. This boy was kidnapped because the kidnapper knew that his parents had just bought a car. So they thought they must have a lot of money. So they took the kid to get the money. The boy's family spent days looking for him. Finally, a witness to the abduction came forward and from the family's photo identified both Javier and his teenage abductor. In shock, the five-year-old's relatives realized that his kidnapper was a 17-year-old friend of their family. How did the community feel about that kidnapping? We feel really tense. At any time of the day, they are kidnapping children, and not only children, but adults too, without caring if they have money or not. Gabriela had told me where I might find some of Javier's family. I'm heading over there to see if they'll talk to me. When we arrive at the address, the little boy's aunt is at home and willing to speak to me about his murder. How do you feel towards the person who murdered your nephew? It makes me really angry. These are people that don't even deserve death. Death would be too easy for them. They have destroyed a family psychologically and morally. In all aspects, they have destroyed a family. Even more so that it was a small child who doesn't deserve that kind of death. It is really horrible the way he died. It turned out that Javier's teenage kidnapper had been acting on behalf of a ruthless kidnapping gang. In a bid to make a terrifying name for themselves, the kidnappers murdered Javier by injecting him in the heart with battery acid. Just imagine you are that small and someone is injecting you and you are burning inside and you are only five years old. It is so unjust. In my many years as a crime reporter, this story is one of the most harrowing I have ever heard. It's unbelievable that in this city, children from poor backgrounds are being killed by their own neighbors for small sums of money. I've already been told that one of the reasons why so few kidnappings get reported is because victims are afraid that the police may be corrupt and working with the kidnappers. This leaves me with a troubling thought. In a society where no one can be trusted, what would I do if a member of my family was kidnapped? I'm on my way to meet a man who felt he'd no choice but to take the law into his own hands after his family was devastated by a violent kidnap. In July 2000, 
Paola Gallo was abducted and killed by kidnappers. Her father, Eduardo, a wealthy business consultant, has agreed to meet me and tell me the full story of his family's horrifying ordeal. Please come inside. What kind of person was she? Well, she was a very, a very happy girl. She, she loved to, uh, to play jokes to anyone. Uh, she loved to make you laugh. Although Eduardo wasted no time in paying the $20,000 that the gang demanded, he would never see his daughter alive again. She was shot with a 45 caliber gun in the neck. At least she, she, she died uh, immediately. This, this was like, uh, I, would say, I was going to say like a uh, cold water bath, but that would be nothing compared to what I felt. In the days after Paola's murder, the reasons why she was killed started to emerge. During the delivery of the ransom, the kidnappers themselves were robbed of half the money, and three of them were killed by unknown assailants. The remaining members of the gang killed Paola when they realized they didn't have the full ransom money. The police immediately assumed that Eduardo was behind the attack on the criminals. They said, okay, Mr. Gallo, uh, we're making an investigation. And in order to, to do our investigation, we would like you to explain us how those guys were dead. Maybe you have an idea. Well, I don't have an idea, and if you're meaning by having an idea that I killed him, you, you can all go fuck your mother. And I was really, really angry. I, I lost my head. I started shouting them, yelling them, insulting them, and sending them where they should go. You lost your temper because you just lost your daughter. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to cement that I murdered the kidnappers, and because of that, they killed my daughter. And I said, well, you're, you're not only stupid, you're corrupt. In that moment is when I realized that they were not going to make an investigation. Knowing that a number of the gang were still on the loose, Eduardo began to track down his daughter's killers. I started collecting uh, information like photographs, like uh, uh, information about their families, their sons, their wives, their brothers, they fa their fathers, their cousins, where they lived, a lot of information. Uh, so I knew what I was, what I was looking, whom I was looking for, and uh, then I understood that they were four missing, and I said, okay, well, let's, let's find them. Through his own investigations, Eduardo was able to find three of his daughter's kidnappers and have them immediately arrested by the police. Then I continued looking for another one who was uh, the one who, who shot Paola. I found him in the uh, in Estado de Mexico. I had only two bodyguards, so we did the, the job that was supposedly to be done by the authorities. We delivered this guy. Even though the kidnappers were all arrested, corruption in Mexico means Eduardo has to regularly check to ensure they haven't bribed their way out of prison. From time to time, I like to go to prison in order to be sure they're there. It has to be done in Mexico. Maybe in another country not, but in Mexico you have to be sure that things are kept the way they should. Check to make sure they're still in jail yes. because it's Mexico, you never yeah. know. Mm -hmm. What satisfaction does it give you that you actually managed to solve your daughter's crime? Well, it's not a matter of satisfaction. It's only a matter of, uh, of having justice. Uh, and also it's a way uh, of telling, even, uh, even she cannot hear me, but it's a way of saying, Paul, I love you. I'm in Mexico City, and I've discovered that in this huge metropolis, life is cheap and death is a celebrated part of the culture.
This is a city ravaged by crime and corruption, where kidnapping has become such a popular form of crime that poor people are kidnapping their own neighbors with deadly consequences. I now realize that my investigation won't be complete until I meet the kidnappers. I've come to the largest prison in Mexico where a man convicted of kidnapping has agreed to talk. Filiberto Vargas is now serving 60 years for allowing his home to be used by the gang to hold the victim hostage. 11 and a half a thousand prisoners are in here, including Filiberto, the kidnapper. He's part of a gang who kidnapped and raped a young woman. And he's here and he's going to tell us his side of the story. I'm being led out to a yard where Filiberto is waiting to meet. What brought a pensioner like you to commit this crime? I didn't do it out of necessity. I wanted to buy a taxi so I could have a little extra money. How much ransom did you demand from the family of the victim? I don't know anything about that. My job was just to take food to the victim. I was going to receive 50,000 pesos. During the court case, the kidnapped victim revealed she had been repeatedly raped during the time she was held hostage. When did you find out that she had been raped? Not until I was taken to a police station. They told me they believed that she had been raped. And they tried to blame me, but I deny it. I've never had contact with the lady. Is that, is that true? Is it, you're in jail, you're serving 60 years. You can tell the truth now. Yes. My relationship was merely that of a carer. I didn't talk to her. I was only looking after her. But you must have heard her, her noise, her talking, her screams, her, her crying. I was constantly sent out of the house to get refreshments and snacks. I never heard her. You, you're an intelligent man. You read the newspapers. Every day you hear the impact of kidnapping on people, the human tragedy on themselves. You must have known the woman in your house you were feeding was going through hell. Now, there is no way back from what I've done. I regret it so much. That was just greed. I should have just been happy with my freedom and the little bit of money that I had. Although I don't believe Filiberto when he says he knew nothing about the rape, I do believe him when he says he wasn't the leader. The reality is that Filiberto was just a small cog in a big machine. The big bosses of the kidnapped gang that he was involved with are still on the loose, simply because they have the money and connections to pay the authorities not to convict them. Since I've been here, I've begun to get a sense of how the culture of corruption has become like a deadly cancer, spreading its way throughout Mexican society. Kidnapping and other crimes go unpunished here because the rule of law in Mexico is weak and the government seems to be losing control, sending out a clear message that crime pays. As long as Mexico remains a largely poor country, where rich and powerful criminals can operate with impunity, then the kidnappings will increase and organized crime will continue to hold a deadly grip over the capital, making Mexico City one of the world's toughest towns. Thank you.